Washington Grown is brought to you by the Washington State Department of Agriculture's Specialty Crop Block Grant Program and the Washington Hospitality Association. Hi everyone, I'm Christy Gornson and welcome to Washington Grown. Washington is home to hundreds of different crops we all like to eat, like cherries and apples and of course potatoes, but we're also home to crops like peanuts and of course mushrooms. By the end of this episode, you're gonna be saying, who knew? We'll head to the Snoqualmie Valley where farmers Will and Rowan will show us the fascinating science behind growing culinary mushrooms. This is like a fairyland. Then we'll head over to the Wandering Goose, a Southern Flair Cafe where we'll be making their famous biscuits with mushroom gravy. Ooh. Look at that, good job. And we'll head to Alvarez Farms where they grow over 400 kinds of crops from peppers to peanuts and even eggplants. <laughs> you think I have enough eggplants here? <laughs> All this and much more today on Washington Grown. Stopping by the Wandering Goose, an endearing southern influenced cafe in Seattle's Capitol Hill. This fun and funky spot is well known for its home cooked southern favorites that are inspired by owner and chef Heather Earnhardt's southern roots. There's a lot of like family recipes, a brownstone front cake that's um, a recipe that's from my great grandmother. We have a hangtown fry, a bubble and squeak, but mostly we do big uh, biscuits and biscuit sandwiches, all big and it has you know, good flavor. Yeah. And, you know, when you're a southerner, your food is such a centerpiece of all family events. It was a really big part of growing up. There's not many places in Seattle where you can get southern food that's pretty authentic. It tastes homemade. I can get my sweet and my savory in in one meal. Um, they've got delicious desserts. I started baking when I was eight years old. My grandmother baked a lot and she catered out of her home kitchen um, for 50 years. So I grew up watching her the Wandering Goose's baked goods are famously delicious, and the comfort food menu is seasonal, affordable, and plentiful. These are probably the best biscuits in Seattle, uh, and we're never disappointed. The name The Wandering Goose comes from a children's book Heather wrote, which sits on the cafe shelves next to her cookbook. The whimsical restaurant reflects Heather's personality and cooking style. I mean, some people say it's like a little kind of a hip grandma-ish, which I'm not that old yet. <laughs> no, you're not. I think it, you know, people take food too seriously sometimes. Yeah. So I wanted, you know, someone to come in and get a plate of food and like really enjoy mm -hmm. it. Later in the show, Heather will show me how to make her famous biscuits with mushroom gravy. Ooh. Look at that, good job. Mushrooms are another popular crop in Washington that people may not know much about. Today we're at a farm in Duval to see how the process works. Tucked away in the trees, the team at Snow Valley Mushrooms mixes science with a whole lot of fun. So Will and Rowan working together, selling mushrooms, growing mushrooms. Will, Rowan and their team grow different mushroom varieties including shiitake, blue oyster and piopini. Their high quality all begins with where the mushrooms grow. They basically are growing on this sawdust that we get from the mill and mm. that we allow to decompose uh, before we formulate the substrate with it. The substrate is the block of material that will become home to the mushrooms. So we, we get the right mixture of, gra of grain and bran and sawdust in there and add water. Logan is our master uh, substrate hydration specialist. Wow, it's an intuitive a, process. That's an awesome title. Done with four oh, gallon wow, buckets. Logan. Yeah. But don't let their relaxed nature fool you. The entire process is extremely scientific. Yeah, we were making a synthetic log, but I mean, we're using natural products yeah. to, and, we're, and we're, we're kind of cheating by using steam to sterilize it in our gigantic pressure cooker over here. They sterilize the substrate to kill off any fungus like mildew that could compete with the culinary mushrooms. If it's shiitake mushrooms versus local aggressive mildew, 
The shiitake you're gonna lose every time. Once sterilized, it's time for the mushrooms to meet the substrate. So this is our inoculation room. This is a sterile facility. It's, we have to keep the, there a positive pressure of very clean air, like it's filled with a balloon of HEPA filtered air so that no mold spores can get inside the facility. Crew members add the specific mushroom spores to the substrate, then heat seal the bags. Within a couple of days, changes begin to happen. Uh, when, the, when the fungi in the bags is, is eating up the sawdust, it's, it's basically letting off CO2 and gobbling up oxygen, and there's gaseous transfer that happens through these patches that allows that to keep happening. So when it's ready, what do you, what do, you do with this part then? I'm gonna show you. We okay. take it to the grow room and we take it out of that bag. Whoa! So this is like a fairyland. See that. And as you notice, as you walk through the door, it's much cooler in here, it and it's much more humid. Mm -hmm. The air feels a I lot feel different. feel it, You're right. So the, the bags have been opened. At this point, we're looking at some beautiful blue oyster mushrooms that have been opened up. These oyster mushrooms live out their whole life cycle in the plastic bag, oh, okay. as you see. And it's really the opening of the bag and the exposure to oxygen in this wonderful human environment in here that really mm. stimulates them and triggers them to fruit. Uh, why we want to harvest at that prime time is because the mushroom will have a longer shelf life, a little bit better texture in the pan, it'll be a little bit firmer. Well, Logan's going to show me how to harvest, right? Ah, uh, that's right. As you can see, like these guys are really young, yeah, and then these guys are older. So these ones will grow up into these, okay. and these are when we want to take it. it. Is there a way that I can ruin this? Because that might happen. You can really, just uh, a lot of pressure really fast. Just be gentle. There you go. Oh, I got it. After I finished up my job, it was time to say goodbye. Will and Rowan, thank you so much for showing me around Snow Valley Mushrooms. It's, I had no idea that this is how you do it. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. We wandered back to the Wandering Goose, a Southern Flair Cafe in Seattle's Capitol Hill. This restaurant has heavenly baked goods and hearty Southern dishes. Owner and chef Heather Earnhardt enjoys being able to incorporate fresh and local Northwest ingredients into her Southern recipes. There's so much that is grown here that I was surprised when I first moved here. Like collard greens grow really well yeah. in Eastern Washington. Okra, apples and stone fruits and yeah. cherries and all this crazy stuff. Like cherries don't grow in North Carolina. So it's like, <laughs> yeah, it's nice like... to incorporate the Washington ingredients, you know, with making Southern food. Mm -hmm. It's cool. So what are we going to make today? What do I get to make? So we're going to do biscuits and then mushroom gravy. So I figured we'd do something um, with mushrooms that are grown just right outside of yeah. Olympia. And some of your delicious biscuits. Yeah. Okay. Get to make biscuits I today. Like it. <laughs> so we have some biscuit flour here. It's biscuit flour. It's just a softer, if you feel it, it's a little softer. Oh, it's um, really soft, yeah. From a winter wheat, so it, it really makes the biscuits light and fluff. We pour in our biscuit flour and then add some baking powder, baking soda, and a little bit of sugar. Some people say no sugar at all, but I like a little bit. And then some kosher salt. salt. Okay. And then we're gonna turn the mixer on, put it on low, and then you wanna add the butter. After the butter is mixed in, we add some buttermilk. Heather tells me the trick for a perfect biscuit is to not overmix. My granny used to say it was if you mix a biscuit 11 times, it's 10 times too many. <laughs> oh, so sad. When our dough is perfectly mixed, we lay it out and press it. It's really you want. light and fluffy. Yeah, you see all light? Yeah. It's now time to cut our dough into biscuits. So we dip it in flour, and then the trick is not to twist it when you press it down. Okay. So you just want to go straight Shit. down. No because if you twist it, it's going to seal the sides, and they're not going to rise as high. Oh. So I'm going to let you cut those. I give Heather's technique a try. You're not twisting. I'm not twisting. <laughs> I'm, whoop, I did a little twist there. <laughs> Next, I butter the top of our biscuits. That one's going to have a lot of butter Don't on get it. on your shirt. <laughs> so I'm used that to getting dirty. Extra buttery. Yeah. Once the biscuits are buttered, we throw them in the oven and head over to make our mushroom gravy. Okay, so we have step one of our biscuits and gravy in the oven. Yep, now we have to do in the oven. Step two, which is actually make the mushroom, mushroom gravy. gravy. Okay, yeah. and we have our beautiful bowl 
of Washington Grown Mushrooms. These are um, grown right down in Olympia. That's um, awesome. From a family-run business that's been growing mushrooms since the 30s. Our gravy needed some prep work, which Heather already did for us. She made a stock with the gills of some portobellos and then roasted a batch of cremini mushrooms until they were golden and full of flavor. Now we're prepped and ready to start the mushroom magic. We start by making a roux with olive oil, butter, and flour. And you can't have a gravy without a roux. No, you can't. You can try, but it won't work. <laughs> but it won't work. <laughs> After our roux has some color, Heather adds two cups of whole milk and our mushroom stock. There's so many gravies that are like pale and yeah. plain. Like you don't want it to taste like flour, it's gonna taste like something. We add our roasted mushrooms with some hot sauce, Worcestershire, herbs, and lemon zest to give our gravy some flavor. We let it thicken for a few minutes while we get our biscuits out of the oven. That. Good job! Those are nice. <laughs> we just we serve a whole biscuit and we do it open face. Awesome. I'm just gonna keep eating the crumbs. See all the herbs wow. in there? Yeah. I can't wait to dig into our dish. Mmm. Mm. Isn't that good? That is delicious. I forgot how oh. good it was. I haven't had it in a while. This is satisfying. You know? Yeah. Super. You get that meaty yeah. the mushrooms. You do. Mm-mm. -mm. To get the recipe to the Wandering Goose's biscuits and mushroom gravy, head over to wagrown.com. Coming up, we're at Alvarez Farms, where you can find everything from peppers to peanuts and even eggplants. You think I have enough eggplants here? <laughs> This is Hilario Alvarez, and he absolutely loves farming his 82 acres near Mabton. And this one over oh, here, wow. they see, oh, for so beautiful, this is neon eggplant. Look at that! His energy is contagious, and we could hardly keep up with him. And this is the ghost pepper, Eesh. and this is the habanero white. Eesh. This is very, very hot yeah. pepper. Don't rub your eyes. Yeah. <laughs> and you, you start to need it, that one that you have that's smoking. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> he grows organic vegetables for Seattle farmers markets, and he grows a lot of crops you'd never guess were grown in our state. How many different vegetables are you growing here? I grow about 400 different types of vegetables. 400? 400 <laughs> I grow the 200 varieties of peppers, and 50 different kinds of eggplant, and then 40 different kinds of tomatoes, and then I grow the 20 different kinds of zucchini, and 15 varieties of uh, the potato. Wow. I got uh, all kinds of potatoes. You never see it, <laughs> you can see it in the Alvarez farm. In addition to all this, Hilario grows about two acres of peanuts each year. He starts them in the greenhouse and then transplants them to his fields in May. Look at that. Yeah. See, they need a, see all these roots over here? Right. They need another four weeks to, oh, to yeah. fill it up, everything that one. So that's essentially all the peanut is, it's just yeah. at the end of the root. Yeah, end of the root, see. Hilario started farming his own land after working on a nearby farm. I started to farm in 1976 for somebody out in the Guapato area to the Filipino farmer. And then in, in 1981, I started to farm self-employer. Nice. In 1988, I buy my own land. 1988, I buy this place first. Why grow so many different and unusual varieties? You know, because um, when I grow a lot of kinds of vegetables, the people, they want to spend me one dollar in each kind of, or try my vegetables each kind, right. you can spend me $400. <laughs> we set out to see as many of his money makers as possible, which wasn't an easy task. Come on over here. Beautiful eggplant. Oh, wow. The purple rain. My goodness, you are the mm -hmm. eggplant growing machine. Mm -hmm. You think I have enough eggplants here? <laughs> <laughs> Let's go check out the peppers. Yeah, call them golden cayenne. Golden so cayenne. Massive. Yeah, this is the golden. They That's it. beautiful. There's a lot See? more to peppers than just straight up jalapenos. This is my own pepper. Your own, very own. Yeah, nobody have it that variety. Purple banana. Yeah, you saw it here banana. first on Washington Grown. Uh -huh. <laughs> the purple banana. Yeah, purple banana. 
But you're doing some amazing work. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you're growing a lot of cool stuff, and a I mean, lot of big fish. I mean, you keep it up. I appreciate this, Hilario. Thank mm. you for having us come out here. Mm -hmm. And you retire soon. <laughs> yeah, yeah, go home. You don't want to see more peppers? No, I do. I was just making a close for the show. <laughs> but we can go see more peppers. <laughs> Chanterelles, Cremini's, Morels, and Truffles, you might recognize one of those exotic sounding names for a type of mushroom, which are prized for their culinary and medicinal properties around the world. The most commonly consumed mushroom is the button variety, which comes in a white or brown color and can be found on grocery store shelves across the US. They provide a rich source of B vitamins, which help us maximize the energy from the food we consume and may help protect our cells from oxidative stress, a process that contributes to aging and cancer. Mushrooms also contain iron, a mineral that will reduce your risk of becoming anemic. And finally, mushrooms are a good source of phosphorus, which is a critical component for building strong and healthy bones. While many people in Washington enjoy hunting for wild mushrooms, many varieties are inedible and could be toxic. So when mushrooms are on the menu, my advice is to leave the hunting and gathering to the experts and just pick some up at your local Washington farmer's market or grocery store. Coming up, Tomas is out seeing what people think of a Washington-grown watermelon salad. These are good watermelons. <laughs> <laughs> They're grown oh, right here in our out. state. And we'll be in the Second Harvest Kitchen making a colorful Washington-grown stir-fry. Hey, let's go. One of the amazing things about Washington is that it produces over 300 different crops, and many of which you may not have even realized even grew here. We're talking hazelnuts, mint, cranberries, and even watermelons. Well, my friends over there at the Dovetail Joint Mobile Kitchen in Richland are taking mint and watermelon, combining them together into a salad that not only screams summertime, but it looks good too. So Marin, tell me a little bit about Dovetail Joint. So our menu is really seasonal. We like to do fresh, locally sourced. Um, we like to use sustainable products. And one of the things I'm noticing on your menu here is you have this watermelon salad that's combining mint and watermelon, which are two crops that maybe people don't realize are grown here. Yeah. So what was the inspiration behind that? Just summertime in a bowl and <laughs> like you know, that. you can't, <laughs> you're only getting that great watermelon locally for you know about a month out of the year. Yeah. And so people get really excited about the watermelon salad coming back. I met with some customers who were excited to give this summer salad a try. All right, so let me ask you a question. Do you enjoy eating watermelons? I do very much. Yeah, I love watermelons. I love watermelons, yeah. How often would you say you eat them? Uh, not, not as often as I should, actually. The Dovetail Joint has this incredible watermelon salad I'd love for you to try. and Tell us what you think. That is awesome. Oh, this is awesome. Super juicy, super fresh, really flavorful. It, it hits all the parts of my palate that I want it to. <laughs> Packed with all these like interesting flavors that kind of explode in your mouth. I love it. These are good watermelons. <laughs> <laughs> They're growing oh, right great, here yeah. in our state. Did you know Washington is home to several different climates? That's why we're able to grow all these different crops. I'm sitting down with Nick Bond, the Washington State climatologist, to talk about our state's unique microclimates. You are focused on what is happening as far as temperature and precipitation and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, so what uh, the Climate Office tries to do is be kind of the source of climate and weather information, past, present, and future. And uh, what this map illustrates here is just the distribution of average rainfall across the state uh, on an annual basis. And what's very interesting as a climatologist about the state is just the amazing contrasts we have over a very short distance. And so, uh, microclimates? Explain yeah, what th that is. Yeah, that is basically um, the climate that is particular to um, a small region. And in particular, because of our terrain and the land 
sea contrast and so forth, we have a lot of microclimates and that microclimate can change over a very short distance. We can either blame or uh, <laughs> thank the mountains, sure. depending on your point of view. So it can be a much different climate and obviously a much different landscape where you'll be in, you know, kind of desert in one spot and a few miles away there's forests. Yeah, we do kind of live in a cool state. Yeah, yeah, and that, <laughs> it, it does make it a complicated situation. And when it's difficult for you, it's got to be difficult for people like the farmers and growers who rely on information coming from you. Th that's right. And uh, yeah, one of the challenges there for the uh, agricultural community is that it's not always the same uh, from year to year. A lot of it has to do with um, trying to anticipate, you know, what's the growing season going to be yeah. like. How do microclimates um, impact just, you know, average People. Certainly, um, a lot of people around here are gardeners, of course. Yeah. There are certain spots that are on the cool side, other spots are, you know, on the, on the warm side. Uh, wind is a big deal. Um, and there are places like around Whidbey Island, it's really windy. That's a good thing. You know, you're a kite flyer, let's sure. say. That's but if right. you hit the wind, maybe you, you know, <laughs> don't want to move to Whidbey. You don't want to move to Whidbey. <laughs> well, we're glad that you do what you do. Thanks so much. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>
You got it. It's a good thing that I didn't have a spoon. I would have eaten that. <laughs> then we would have been short. Yeah, we would have been short. <laughs> yeah, this part, it's when you, as soon as you add the peanut butter, you can watch the sauce really thicken. Yeah. Once the peanut butter is added and the sauce has boiled, we blend it until it's smooth. To finish it off, we add in a bit of fresh cilantro. Now that our sauce is complete, it's time to make our stir fry. Okay, so the sauce is ready to go. Our sauce is done. We have some rice. Mm -hmm. Now we just need the stir fry part with all these great Washington grown vegetables. We chop all our veggies and then fry them in batches with sprinkles of salt and pepper. Kristen lays all of our colorful veggies on a platter. We add some chicken and then our stir fry dish is complete. Looks lovely! Thank you! Yeah, so just a rainbow of colors. I think it has a, such a level, like it's a very lively presentation. It is. So it's nice to put on the table. And then people can just kind of grab what they want. Mm -hmm. all right. Some of my kids avoid certain sections. Yeah. <laughs> Let's do it. I'm excited and I'm super excited to taste Asian Explosion. <laughs> Sauce. Well, this is fun to know too, because there's, you know, there are times where maybe if you do a CSA or if you go to the farmers market and you come home with some vegetables that you want to find some way to use them, but you're not quite sure. Mm -hmm. And stir frying is always a safe yeah. way to try. And you'll have the Asian explosion sauce in your freezer. Yes, ready, ready to, to go. go. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we drizzle our Asian explosion sauce on top, and finally, it's time to try. Mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Asian Explosion. To get the recipe for Kristen's Asian Explosion stir fry sauce, head over to wagrown.com. Cauliflower, watermelon, and of course peanuts are all great examples of the wide variety of crops that make Washington so special. That's it for this episode of Washington Grown. Thanks for watching.